This is Whitley's Guide, covering the Terrapin Class Pathfinder. Initial deliveries of production model U4A-3 Block 1 Terrapin Class ships began on September 19, 2796, with the first units forming the core of the newly established 198th Utility and Support Wing in a formal handover at MacArthur. The motto of the squadron being, We've Got You Covered. As part of the United Empire of Earth's intended phased military reorganization, elements of the 198th Wing were detached to active fleets as they became available, ensuring that the newly minted Terrapins saw action quickly. Indeed, the design's first flooding occurred only two months after its introduction, when a single Terrapin downed a mercenary fighter as part of a combined forces narcotics interdiction operation off Castra. The Terrapin very easily settled into its fleet operations role, proving itself an effective support craft, armored personnel carrier, and, when f called for, a fighting platform. Military planners were extremely pleased with the ease of adoption and frequently cited the Terrapin as proof of the success behind the New Model Navy initiative of the intermediate post Meser era. The original naval order for Terrapins was quickly followed by a second, similarly sized request from the UEE Marines. Although the Terrapin lacks the heavy guns used by dedicated dropships, its protective armor and enhanced scanning capabilities mean that it is ideal as an armored personnel carrier. Terrapin APCs quickly became a frequent sight on convoy duty and in smaller scale interdiction missions. It was the UEEM Terrapin, which located and then boarded the liner Astoria, during the 2820 hijacking disaster. The boarding Terrapin itself was destroyed during the ensuing explosion, but its crew survived, along with the crew and passengers they helped lead to safety. Marines are said to prefer travel aboard the smaller Terrapins when possible. Their more advanced systems offering a far smoother, if more cramped ride, than traditional troop ships. Terrapins have also became popular for safe landing operations. Generally, any landing where it will face no more than small arms fire. A rumor persists that UEEM operates an advanced technology, improved stealth, as it's called, for Terrapins during covert boarding operations. There has been no proper sighting of this spacecraft and its existence has been roundly denied by both Anvil, Aerospace, and the military. Reconnaissance and scouting units began transitioning to the Terrapin five years after its introduction as an armored utility ship. Though this adoption was rockier than the initial launch, Recon pilots used to incredibly fast, light spacecraft that rely on speed over armor to escape trouble were quickly turned off by the Terrapin's opposite nature. This changed in a single incident. The ship was said to have paid for itself in 2814 when a reconnaissance ship flown by Commander Bruce Dunbar successfully tracked a Van Duel raiding party across four systems without being identified. The tactical information gathered from that mission helped form important elements of modern strategic understanding of the Van Duel. The ensuring interdiction and destruction of that raiding party by elements of the Ninth Fleet was a major public relations victory for the UEE. In the three years following the incident, every single frontline reconnaissance unit received at least one Terrapin and a crew assignment. The largest downside to the early Terrapin was the difficulty of power management, which required that a pilot become particularly familiar with the design in order to use it most effectively. With multiple flight configurations, some of which significantly altered the design's on-orbit geometry, the difficulty in mastering the Terrapin became apparent. 
Later models would erase, if not ease this, uh, adapting from the tricks developed by the early pilots for managing such unusual set of abilities. Anvil Aerospace began rolling out the modified U4A3 Block 2 version in July 2845 with battlefield upgrade kits, bucks as they're shortly called, converting extant Block 1 models to parity over the course of the following 24 months. The U4A3 Block 2 transition was the result of a massive review of pilot experiences from previous half century. Thousands of current and former Terrapin drivers were interviewed, and countless hours of combat and flight footage were reviewed as part of the improvement process. The biggest takeaway from the process was that the ship's durability would make it ideal for exploratory roles that it had not yet filled. As a result, Block 1 models dropped a largely unused remote chin turret and were given extended batteries, improved shielding, and a sensor suite capable of gathering and storing more data than would ordinarily be required for fire support spacecraft. Though the changes were not the result of a formal request for proposal, the Navy quickly saw the value and began purchasing Terrapins specifically for exploratory service assignments. Although the Terrapins' active service includes lengthy periods of peacetime, it is a design that is considered in demand under any circumstances. Admiral Voskant famously claimed that the Terrapins' multi-role capabilities meant that there was no single spacecraft he would rather have in the Ready-5 position. Indeed, Terrapin pilots quickly adapted to keeping track of more than a kill score. Auxiliary and support squadrons typically treat with equal importance the number of missions flown, the number of rescues performed, or the number of boardings conducted. Exploratory squadrons compete in terms of raw data uploaded. In all these areas, the Terrapin has become a record setter. A Terrapin currently holds the record for live rescues, pickup of humans, who have been exposed to pure vacuum. Terrapin were among the first spacecraft dispatched as part of the Synthworld project. The massive construction project was such a drain on Navy resources that by the early 30th century, it was estimated that three in five Terrapin had been assigned to the effort at some point in their service. In addition to APC and search and rescue duties, multiple attempts were made to modify them for small-scale ore transport and mineral analysis. These modification efforts were not notably successful, although a well-known Synthworld project patch displays an anthropomorphic terrapin toting a shovel and bucket. Construction-oriented terrapins received a distinctive yellow and black paint scheme during this era, which is still commonly associated with the effort. In 2910, the Terrapin became an unexpected household name following a starring role in a popular vid. To the Stars, partially financed by the Empire's Office of Civilian Outreach, featured a ragtag band of humans aboard a garishly painted purple and orange Terrapin, affectionately nicknamed Maxwell. The Terrapin was played by an active duty U4A3 Block 2 model on loan from the Navy, nominally assigned to the UEEN Declan Smith. Referred to early on as an ugly lump, the spacecraft ultimately saves the day and becomes a home for its crew of explorers. The ubiquity of the film and the popularity of the personified spacecraft led to a brief craze with a number of companies producing Terrapin-themed merchandise for an eager civilian population. Maxwell itself returned to active duty after filming, but was ultimately donated to the Garber Aerospace Museum, where it was restored to its on-camera appearance and is now on permanent display. The modern U4A3 Block 3 model premiered in 2899, 
featuring, among other things, upgrades to weapon hardpoints and a number of control surfaces. The Block 3 also formalizes a long-time trick used by Terrapin pilots, the ability to release energy by toggling flight modes. While no battlefield upgrade option was created, Block 3 space frames have now fully replaced the Block 2 model. Recent years have seen the Terrapin fill out its combat history, as battles with the Vanduul have become larger and more commonplace. In a noteworthy 2944 engagement, a flight of six Scythe fighters happened into a quartet of Terrapins operating with systems low in stealth mode as part of a training observation. With their emissions low, the Terrapin crews spent a terrifying eight minutes avoiding detection before ultimately being in a position to turn the table and get the jump on the Vanduul. The UEEN flight suffered damage but lost no spacecraft, while five of the six scythes were destroyed. Gun camera footage was not able to determine the fate of the sixth, but it is considered to be a probable kill. It was also around the turn of the century that civilians began more widespread operation of Terrapins. The Navy surplus thousands of Block Twos as part of the transition and then began rotating out Block Threes on a 15-year cycle. The Civilian Refurbishment Program, operated by Anvil out of a dedicated decommissioning facility at Nova Kiev, makes veteran Terrapins available to corporations and individual users. ArcGen was the first large corporation to adopt Terrapins en masse, adopting the ship's reconnaissance capabilities for their traditional survey work. Noteworthy civilian operators today include Meriden Transport, where Terrapins are used for higher security planetary hops, and Grut, where they have become instrumental in search and rescue operations. Individual Terrapin owners have become extremely common in recent years, with thousands of ships on the official registry. Owner-operators consider them to be a sound investment, even used. A solid spacecraft capable of meeting many essential common roles while still being rough and tumble enough to adapt to a constantly changing galaxy. This has been an extract from the 2947 Whitley's Guide to Spacecraft, covering the U-4A Terrapin service history. Reprinted with permission, Whitley's Guide is property of Galveston Publishing, 2860 to 2948, all rights reserved. This reading was conducted by Red J. Okay, so that's as far as I can go with that. Let's get into commentary. This article was in a very old jump point, jump point 6.02, and I want to underscore this. The Terrapin is a really cool ship. Um, the Terrapin has changed its, I would say, its scope of operations greatly since this was posted, and even when this was posted. Um, I had to catch myself a few times because they kept talking about its combat prowess, and it doesn't exactly have a lot of hit, uh, it has tons of armor which isn't in game yet. It just has a large HP pool for its size, which is great. The problem comes with the lack of offensive weaponry. I like that, as they mentioned in the Block 2 models and beyond, they, they, they go out of the way to mention the chin turret and things like that are removed. Instead, they have the better shielding, which they have to turn off for their low EM readings. <laughs> and of course, um, more advanced scanning packages, which is what the name of the game for this ship is. It's not really meant for search and rescue. I think any ship is with good scanners is going to be helpful in search and rescue. But this ship is not particularly geared for it because at maximum you have two uh, players or an NPC and a player um, on board and there's not quite a lot of room inside. There's a little bit of space to kind of, I would say, have like a short range kind of exploration. Um, there's a mention in this story of the Navy... Terrapin following across four star systems, Vanduul, 
Um, I, I guess they made stops at different places discreetly. You know, they stopped at random trading hubs or maybe abandoned outposts or maybe they, some the Navy left them fuel canisters on the way. Like, hey, we're coming through to the next system. Drop off those fuel canisters because at this moment, this ship would not be able to make it through four star systems. And it's very small, so it's um, it may have a quantum drive, a QD, but it wouldn't have a jump drive to be able to navigate between star systems. So anyway, that's an example of how some things kind of changed over the years since this came out. One of the positives with the Terrapin is uh, it's mentioned in this indirectly in this in this article is that it became a starring role in a popular vid. That actually may be referring to uh, the Mighty Little Terrapin uh, series. There was a series of like these meme-like GIFs and cartoons that were made for the Reddit Star Citizen community, and they are amazing. And honestly, I think that's probably what they're referring to here. Hey, this is Red J from the future. Sorry to kind of give you a jarring tra transition here, but anyway, I wanted to mention uh, that Dark Constant, who I'm about to talk about, is uh, no longer active in our Star Citizen, but I still wanted to give them credit for their fantastic work. So if you like the little Terrapin series, and or if you find it after, you, after you're listening to this and you go search for that, just understand that they probably don't want to hear about Star Citizen if they're not active in the community anymore. But um, feel free to upvote and you know drop comments on, the, on those videos because uh, they are fantastic. Uh, they're in the R Star Citizen section, uh, you Dark Constant. Uh, made them. And uh, one of the biggest things I'd like to mention about these type of topics is that something creative that makes people laugh, that makes people excited, that gets the community talking about something that's an issue is helpful. Um, I think the little terrapin, or in some cases people call it the turtle, is uh, it, it, it is one of those ships that's kind of had to have its it's 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 area kind of brought down a little bit in the size um there's other ships that are far better suited for search and rescue i think of the apollos uh with their in, in, incoming you know uh, drone carriers that are able to pull humans or anyone for that matter or that i'm going to get to that in a minute by the way uh but anyway uh back to topic uh the apollo series I think of the Cutty Red with its spotlight and its abilities. And don't forget, it still has scanners. They're just not as incredible as the Terrapins. And what are the Terrapin scanners incredible at? So CIG over the past few years has kind of fleshed out the scanning system. And they basically said that some, some ships will be really good at scanning anomalies. So, for example, the Carrick will have advanced scanners to try to help find jump points. And it'll have an advantage for that. And ships that are capable of these anomaly scans uh, will be more geared towards that project. A prospector, for example, would be reasonable to assume it is going to be better at trying to scan rocks to try to figure out what they're made out of and try to find different asteroids to mine and minerals to find. Um, the same goes for a salvaging ship like the Vulture. Um, and the larger the ship goes, the better its scanners are traditionally, but not always. But I think of the Reclaimer, for example. It is reasonable to expect it will have much better scanners than the Vulture when the dust settles and the full system is initialized. But what about scanning out NPC ships? People? What about players that are flying around in ships? Well, that's where the Terrapin comes in. You see, on the military side, the UEE Navy side, there is the push for for obvious reasons, most ships are geared towards finding enemy ships, finding who's our friends, finding where everybody is. And in search and rescue, usually, the person did not just appear in the middle of space. A ship is either stricken or blown up that that person you're trying to save is near. So having a ship that's military geared would help be helpful in trying to scan and locate these ships that maybe don't have a beacon activated. Um, when you are downed at the moment, at least, in Star Citizen, you click a button to activate a beacon so the whole system can see where you're at. That may not be ideal for every scenario. And I've advocated in the past that there should be some beacon that you can purchase or an up or a side grade that you can program into that beacon to only alert your friends, only alert your org mates. 
um, or only alert people of a certain area, for example, maybe create a distance to it. But if you're in the comm arrays, it will work. And if those comm arrays got hacked or destroyed by the Vanduul incursion or jammed by E-War forces, the powers that be, um, you'll need scanners on board the ship trying to find them to actually matter. Because a person or anyone out in space is a really, really small thing. So you more are scanning for the wreck. You're scanning for the stricken vessel to try to locate the people to save. The Terrapin can do that scanning part, no problem. It's going to do a better job, though, of uh, uh, vectoring in a ship that's bigger or a ship that has medical supplies on board that can hold a couple more people and kind of get them in the space. If they've just been in a firefight where the entire ship blew up, they're probably hurting a little bit. And they're going to need at least level 3 medical beds in order to keep them alive long enough to get them back to the bigger ships or an outpost or a station to be able to bring them back without letting them die. And remember, death does have implications in this game. They're small, to be fair, if you at least recover the body for all the armor and the kit and everything they had, but it still has an implication, and it does have a long-standing impact. Over time, they'll have to regenerate that character. As a reminder, LTI is not based on your character's death. It's based on forever. Your account will always have this. Same with the 10-year insurance, etc., etc. It is not based on the lifetime of this character. So when I'm talking about death, your character's, uh, I'll put it in quotes, uh, lineage will pick up, the, pick up the slack. Their daughter or son will get inherit the ship, and bam, you're back in business as that new person. And of course, you'll still have all your stuff. And that also includes purchases in-game. So just to be clear, I, I, but uh, when we're talking about implications... We're talking about scars that will be uh, uh, physically seen on the character. There are skills that you'll have to relearn, such as strength or endurance, uh, being able to run as far, for example. Smaller things, but they will matter. And of course, if you die with all your stuff and you don't bring the body back, you'll lose all the stuff you had. So the other factor here is we are dealing with ships, and they're still experimenting at the percentages, but when a ship is destroyed or it's stricken, etc., and it's dead in the water, that ship still has a bunch of stuff on it. If a Terrapin pulls up to after the firefight, and the criminals run away, and the bad guys are gone, but who's going to still get the stuff? Terrapin is extremely small on the inside. You have a scanning uh, chair. You have a little bit of habitation, some hygiene, and a single pilot seat. It's just not enough space inside the ship to fit say, even a small ship's worth of plushies and other stuff that they had collected and all their weapon racks and uh, their data, if they have any data systems. Like, I'm thinking of, like, say you pull up to an MSR, a Mercury Star Runner, and you're trying to even just unload all the data racks, just the hard drives out the front, those big old data racks. How are you going to do that on that ship? Plus fit the people that are stricken. Plus, you know recover any cargo that was in the cargo bay the answer is you're gonna to have to pick and choose so i've harped on this long enough the point is the terrapin is an excellent ship at sitting still picking up the targets that are coming in sitting on the side of let's say an asteroid going cold where you turn your shields off you turn all your gear off and as this keeps getting better and better with the way they handle em and ir signatures electromagnetic and infrared respectively signatures being able to passively or even actively, but in clever ways, be able to get the information of what ships are out there and where the enemy is, and then try to covertly send that information to your friends. Also being able to tag along with fighters. It is not a tiny ship, but it is a reasonably small ship. And to be honest, in that passive configuration where it's floating in the air or sitting on the side of an asteroid, those type of scenarios, it may be, be able to be used as a single player, basically jumping between the pilot seat and then jumping into the scanner seat and then conducting the scans, relaying the information, jumping back in the pilot seat, etc., and moving on. Anything's possible, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at with the Terrapin. I think it's it's it only fills half the role of a search and rescue ship, if not less than half. Um, I think as an APC, it is not an APC anymore, mainly due to the fact that they have insisted that players will and, and NPCs will need to have seats, proper seats. 
in order to, when there's high G maneuvers, especially in Atmo, and don't forget, some moons have low gravity and such, so they will have atmospheric effects. Uh, they will throw you around like a rag doll when, when, if you're standing up. You can, even if you're laying on the floor, you'll still experience it. If you're not sitting in a seat, and particularly, a, per, preferably a crash seat, like that looks like it comes out of a roller coaster, uh, you're going to have problems. Now, ships that handle drop shipping are the Valkyrie, the Legion Air. These are ships, uh, the, the Prowler, but the Prowler does have you standing up, to be fair, but you're in a lock seat type of configuration with the air dams. Um, these ships are built as APCs. There are plenty of other ships, and it doesn't mean we can't use this ship as, as, as an emergency way to get away from problems or use it as a temporary way to zip around. Just understand that if there's high speed maneuvers going on and lots of juking and dodging, your folks in the back may end up with a lot of injuries. Um, so the APC and SNR duties are kind of a poor choice. We talked about the cultural implications. We talked about the roles. Um, tampering expectations. And I also talked about its benefits. The ship is capable of doing some very interesting things. Um, one of the things that I thought was really glossed over in this story that they wrote for Whitley's Guide was the um, the trick, as they call it, of being able to change the, the, mod, the modes of the ship. What they mean by that is there's large doors all over the ship that allow heat to exhaust from the ship. It has these advanced scanners on this tiny little package, so there's not a lot of room for cooling, right? And the idea is that you can button up the ship, you can close those big doors, and allows it for temporary periods of time to lower its IR signature while it's still actively scanning or passively scanning. So this gives it a really unique trait. You know, I, I think that's actually um, very prevalent in the, in the article, Later on, they talk about how they were sneaking by and monitoring these these scythes um, for eight minutes. You know, how big of a deal eight minutes is. That's probably because they were starting to build up a ton of heat and they had to open those doors up to keep up. And um, it also brings up an interesting topic. I don't know if this article is canon or not anymore, but I question if... Uh, the Van Duel focus more on IR signatures than they do EM signatures in their targets and threat analysis. So on at least their fighters on the sides, I have seen normal scanning features. However, our ships are replicas of the Van Duels. If you've jumped in, in a scythe, a glaive, if you've jumped in these ships, you will notice that they are adapted for humans. They speak to you in English or into the language that you, you have your game translated to. And they also are adapted for a human being to a certain extent. Uh, and that's an interesting factor. I think the scanning systems on board naturally would be changed over to UEE approved scanning systems. And for practical reasons, they would be those systems. It's a shame. It really is. Because training uh, your, your org mates and such uh, by having these replicas as close as possible to what the enemy has would actually be better. I would love to know if they focus heavily on IR input and practically ignore EM signatures in order to find their targets, at least on the fighter level. So do they need larger ships to communicate those EM signatures? Do they rely more on just raw heat? When I say the word infrared, I mean heat. So the heat and exhaust off a ship. That gives the Terrapin a tremendous advantage. It could be why in multiple of these engagements, the Terrapin did quite well against the Van Duel. It's because it can bottle up its heat. It can't bottle up its EM signatures, but it can sure as heck bottle up its heat. It's just one big trick, as they mentioned. And once again, the article only glosses over that tiny little fact in like a sentence. But the rest of the article may, many of its, 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 its achievements <laughs> may be because of that. So yeah, it's a ship that had many roles, like many early ships. The Terrapin's been around a long time, and uh, it does have the military tax on it, if you're talking about value and costs. Um, I don't think it's incredibly worth it to purchase in the store, if we're going to drop out of lore talk for a moment and get into value talk. Um, I don't think it's worth purchasing in the store. I think it's a great purchasing game, though. And I think ships that can can haul it around are going to be very interesting. I would love to see if this could fit on top of a Liberator, for example. 
Um, I would also love to see this thing parked on top of a Kraken. I think it has a value on the battlefield by being able to get advanced scanning packages in a tiny format out beyond where you're comfortable taking your ship. I also think it would be a great use of resources to put this thing out where, say, a jump point is, where you want to move your capitals to, and you you really want to know what's going on over there before you go sending this through. Send that little that little that little terrapin over, you know, a few minutes before you all get there. So this ship would be perfectly suited for, say, an advanced guard being able to get in earlier than the rest of the fleet by a few minutes. Swing in there, start start feeling things out. That being said, this ship does not have some kind of capital or large class scanners. It does have limitations on what it can do. Remember, I, I, I made a case for it to be useful as not risking larger ships. It's also great if you want to have a reasonably budgeted ship, once again, purchased in game, um, it, it, to work with with the rest of your fleet. Or if you're just a dedicated support, it may be worth purchasing it or owning it for to those who are out there who are owners. I'm not downing on the ship. It's a great ship. I just feel it's probably about 30 USD higher than it should be um, due to its military tax. I think also one of the other unknowns is the armor on this ship. This is something that I've brought up across many ships now. It is supposed to have heavy military-grade armor, and that was how it was sold. And I just question how that's going to handle atmospheres and low Earth, as I'm low moon orbits and such, with, with gravity. Um, will it become extremely hard to control this vessel? Will it chew up a lot of fuel? I think it will. And it's not that maneuverable to begin with. Granted, it's maneuverable now, but when it has the heavy armor on board and they have to start accounting for this armor, all that weight's going to be thrown around. I think the thrusters are going to have to be weaker. <laughs> They're going to have to uh, uh, be less uh, efficient. And it brings up a question of, will there be a variant of the Terrapin that does not have as much armor, that just relies on its IR trick in order to survive? I would be very interested in that type of ship. Something maybe that's a little more skeletonized, that has light armor, that has a bit more space on the interior because it doesn't have this giant armor, you know, taking it up. Maybe has better resilient cooling systems and just relies on its maneuverability, speed, and its, its longer but still short-term IR protection where it can button up. I think it would be a really cool combination to see a ship that maybe, maybe that'd be like the future of the Terrapin is less of the little battle turtle and more of the uh, the the high speed low drag get in and sneak out you know uh, sneak in get the inf get the info and sneak back and and bail um, and one last thing I I wanted to mention about this article there's multiple times where they mention rescuing humans rescuing humans that's not it's not me it's the article I have to read what's here I I only change things based on turn of phrase I try not to adjust any names or any important dates, or any important, uh, um, like, how they how they say it, um, as best I can. So if, if certain kinds of ships get destroyed, I make sure to mention those, the names of the ships, you know, I mention that, and uh, the upgrade types, and all the historic m moments. So when they mention rescuing humans, and how humans are great at this, and humans are great at that, it's not a slight on the Tavaran, it's not a slight on the Banu, I'm just reading what's here. So I, I like to mention that I think that this is an example of like some of the older lore, especially because the Devaran are actually pretty active in the UEE Navy. That's the only reason I'm bringing this up. It's not me trying to start something. There's, there's nothing here. Uh, the UEE Navy is uh, full of Tavarin. Uh, there's, there's lots of proud Tavarin that are like multi-generational, uh, proud to serve type situation. After the Devarin Moors, uh, they, they moved in with the UEE Navy. And so there's probably some Tavarin that even fly these dang Terrapins. I can't say that for certain, but um, <laughs> based on laws of probability, I would say that there's, there's probably a good chance. So I find it interesting how the article here in Whitley's writes about human this and human that. And I don't think it's... Um, I don't think it's Jax McCleary and the modern Whitley's Guide folks that are that are going out of their way to say that that way. I think it's just more of the common term and the 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 UEE citizen is really what it's meaning to say, you know, or the UEE Navy personnel, you know, is what it's meaning to say. We save this these personnel, you know. It's not 
Uh, but I have to say it like, hey, it's got the number, it's got the best record on saving humans in 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 in, in UE space or something. I have to say it exactly how that is because it's possible there's some other ship that is more save more Tavarin or something. <laughs> I just wanted to add that little addendum there so um, you guys get a full picture. And um, this is interesting. This is an evolution of Whitley's Guide. Whitley's Guide that we know is McCleary and, and, and everybody over there having fun and, and the videos. And the original Whitley's Guide and, and the ship articles are probably, I would argue... <sighs> Second fiddle nowadays. I mean, I, I think th this is kind of an example of where we've come from. Even the videos themselves have evolved multiple times. I, I still, I love the original intro to Whitley's Guide. The skies are mine today. You know, and... Sorry, stars are mine today. <laughs> I love it so much. Stars are mine today. Um, I would say that um, the spectrum dispatches that we see coming out from early jump points could probably use just a little bit of heads up like hey this is this is from this year you know or this is from four years ago this is from 2015 you know mention that because put just putting in tiny print that's smaller than the article at the top this article originally appeared in jump point 6.02 does not really let newer community members know hey by the way the Terrapin's probably not the best at search and rescue or being used as an APC anymore, but we're going to mention it six times in this article or something like that, right? Um, it would be best if they mentioned just one little tidbit about this is from Jump Point 6.02, comma, originally printed in 2014. So if you, it kind of gives you a hint there, like, hey, it, if you want to research this further from the lore and then see what the modern version of the Terrapin can be used for and what you know, is used for in the civilian sector, which is what we have access to. Here you go. So yeah, I, I, I guess that keeps me making videos. I guess that's one more reason to make the videos. But at the same time, I, I would like to see that because I'm realistic and I know that there's only 100 people who watch these videos and I'm greatly appreciative to those who do. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my subscribers. Thank you very much for sticking around. And it's not just a little catchphrase. I really do appreciate it. I make these videos for you. So uh, that's gonna do it today. I, I I was a little I was a little flippy on this one. Uh, um, I don't do outtakes, but uh, there was a lot of outtakes this this go around, and um, someday I may actually uh, maybe share that with my subscribers. Uh, they get they get very uh, they get some of these articles get very fun. And uh, if you want a homework assignment, uh, what I recommend to you is, uh, let's see, where is it? Where is that anthro word? Let's try that one. Talk about that, although a well-known synth world project patch displays an anthropomorphic, an anthropomorphic terrapin. <laughs> try to say that 20 times fast. Just, just try, please. <laughs> That one put me through a loop. And uh, all for a terrapin toting a shovel and bucket. So that'll do it for me. Uh, thank you again. And I wish you all a wonderful and hopefully warmer January into February coming up. And if you get a chance, please get on that 3.18 PTU. I'm having a blast. I'm just waiting for the latest patch to hopefully be able to drop another video trying to compare each one of these patches one by one and different planetary landing locations. 